Okay, hi, so in this video we're going to speak about proteins and enzymes. Now enzymes are a specific type of protein, it's not a completely separate topic, but an enzyme is a very important type of protein that we need to know about. Alright, so the first thing, we're going to talk about proteins in general. Now proteins, what are they? Proteins are molecules which are made up of, okay, so made up of amino acids. Amino acids. Now, proteins, if you think back to the uh, the, the uh, cell video, sorry, proteins are very, very important molecules, and they are made at the ribosomes in the cell. Now, all cells need protein, okay, protein car proteins, sorry, carry out many, many of the functions that allow organisms to survive. So, proteins are an extremely, extremely important molecule. Now, they carry out many different functions, okay, so I'm going to say many different functions in the body or in any organism, many different functions, but we're going to talk mainly about uh, humans or mammals, okay, so many different functions, and those include hormones, hormones such as insulin, uh, adrenaline, they're all uh, made out of protein, okay, they are proteins themselves, so hormones which um, deliver messages to different parts of your body and control uh, very important processes are proteins. Another one is antibodies. Antibodies are proteins, and you should know that antibodies are the things which help you fight off infection. They are part of your immune system, not the only part, but they're produced by white blood cells, and they allow you to fight off infection. All right. Um, they're also used a lot in structure. All right, so structural components are made of protein. An example of that would be collagen. All right, collagen and also keratin. All right, you should have heard of those. Keratin is what you find in your fingernails. Collagen is a structural protein. It's actually the most abundant protein in the whole body. And it's found in your muscles, your skin, your bones, and it just provides that structural um, support. And last but not least, and this is what the rest of the video is going to be about, proteins, or one type of protein, is the enzyme, all right? And enzymes... Are, and this is a definition of an enzyme, biological catalysts. Biological catalysts. All right, what does that mean? Well, a catalyst, you should know from both biology and from chemistry, that a catalyst is something that will speed up a reaction without taking part in the reaction itself. Now, an enzyme is an example of that, um, but uh, which occurs naturally within an organism, okay? We actually make them ourselves. In chemistry, we might use metals as catalysts, but in um, biology, so inside living things, we use enzymes. So, I'm going to write a separate heading of enzymes, as the rest of this video is going to be about the enzymes and not the other types of proteins. All right, so enzymes, they control the rate of biological, whoop, biological processes. Biological processes. All right, and so that is their job. That's actually an extremely important job because without enzymes, then no life would be possible because reactions um, just don't happen fast enough to sustain life if we don't speed them up, and that's what enzymes are going to do. Now, examples of what they do, um, they could either break molecules down, break molecules down, okay? They could build large molecules, which is the opposite, of course. And finally, they could convert one molecule to another. Okay, and what that really means, I'm going to put in brackets actually here, is change its shape. All right, because if you can just not add anything or not take anything away from a molecule, so like a sugar, but you just change the shape of the sugar, it actually becomes a different sugar, right? Um, but you haven't actually built a larger molecule or a smaller molecule, you've just made it um, different, okay? So that's the difference between converting one to another and building larger ones and breaking, um, breaking larger ones down. All right, and so in general, that's what they do. Now let's have a look at how they work which we're going to call, obviously, a mechanism. Okay, mechanism. 
Now, this is very simple. If I said that this here is an enzyme, okay, this is our enzyme. Okay, you can see this gap here, right? I'll just label it like so. Okay, this gap is known as the active site. The active site. This is where um, something is going to come in, it's going to react, and then it's going to leave. All right, and let's say that that something looked like this. The, uh, the thing which is going to go into the active site and react is what we call the substrate. All right, the substrate. That's a fancy word for reactant in this reaction. All right, now what's going to happen is that this substrate is going to come into the active site. Okay, like so. Obviously, it doesn't fit exactly in this diagram, but it will fit in real life. Okay, so it comes in, and this happens. There we go. Let's move the stuff out of the way and make sure it does fit now. So now you can see that the, subs the substrate sorry, has entered the active site. Now, what's going to happen is a reaction is going to occur. And let's say, for example, that in this reaction, what happens is it breaks this molecule down. What's going to happen is half of the molecule, doesn't have to be exactly half, obviously, in real life, but you get the picture turns into something else and therefore the molecule has actually split up we've got two separate smaller molecules now as a result so the reaction has occurred and you now end up with this scenario where you formed two uh, new products okay and they can leave so this one here if this will work there we go can leave okay and this one in blue can also leave and now they're not the substrates anymore they are the products okay both of them are the products and you can see now that the enzyme is now free for that reaction to occur again so another substrate will come in the reaction will occur and then the products will leave and that can carry on and carry on and carry on and that's why we call it a catalyst because it's not changed itself during the reaction the reaction just happens um, and the enzyme is unchanged and so it can keep doing what it was doing all right, and there's a name that we give to this model. It's called the lock and key hypothesis. All right. Basically, what it's saying is the enzyme is like a lock, okay? And when you have the correct key, the, so the substrate, it will fit into the lock and then do its magic and you get the products formed. If you had a substrate, um, let's say this was a substrate as well, right? And this wanted to come in and react. Well, look, it's not going to fit in the active site. And so we have a problem. This key doesn't fit this lock. And so the enzyme would not actually do anything to that reaction. All right. And so that's the incorrect substrate. So that's why we say lock and key, because you need the correct substrate for the correct enzyme in order for the enzyme to do its magic. Okay. Now, there are also factors affecting... Um, enzymes action so how fast an enzyme works okay so I'm going to say factors affecting enzyme all right and there are two key factors that you need to know the first one I'm going to do is very similar to a video you've seen before on photosynthesis because we're going to be talking about temperature all right temperature and if you think back, if you haven't seen that video, please do go and have a look um, as well, because I cover the factors affecting photosynthesis. One of them is temperature. And the reason why temperature affects photosynthesis is because photosynthesis utilizes enzymes. And so this is going to be the exact same relationship as we saw with photosynthesis. And so if I have a, a set of axes like this, okay, on the bottom, I'm going to plot temperature temperature okay and I'm going to do that sorry temperature let's rewrite that last part in degrees Celsius all right and on the y-axis I'm going to write rate of reaction because an enzyme obviously speeds a reaction um, up okay and now I'm going to write some key numbers on the bottom zero so zero degrees Celsius and I'm going to also put in 30 40 and 50 degrees Celsius all right just because they are important now just like it with photosynthesis 
At zero degrees Celsius, it doesn't mean the reaction is not occurring. It just means it's occurring slower than it really should be because enzymes can work at higher temperatures and higher temperature means higher rate of reaction. And so the line is not going to start at the bottom. It's going to start about here. All right. And as you increase the temperature, the rate of reaction will increase. And so we carry on going up and up and up and up. And look, now we're approaching 30, 40 degrees, right? The optimum for most enzymes, especially in humans, okay, is going to be about there. And that is 37 degrees Celsius, which is body temperature, okay? That's when your enzymes are going to be working as fast as they can. And we call that the optimum temperature. Optimum temperature. All right, after the optimum temperature, it starts to get too hot. And the amount of thermal energy causes the protein to vibrate. And eventually, some of the bonds will break and the shape will denature. And that means it will unfold. It's not in its 3D structure anymore. And it has denatured. And that is a permanent change. You can't cool it down and reset it. It's permanently almost melted, if you like. Right? But we call that denatured. And so what happens is after about 40 degrees... We will denature the enzymes and the rate of reaction will plummet because the enzymes no longer work at all. Okay? And so here I'm going to say it has denatured. Okay? So the enzymes have denatured and that's why you have plummeted. Okay, and so that's one of the factors. Now, the other factor which affects enzyme action is the pH. Okay, the pH. Now again, I will draw an axis, like so. And on the bottom, I'm going to have pH. And on the y-axis, I'm going to have rate of reaction. Okay, now you should know that pH ranges from around about 0 to 14, okay? I'm not going to focus on 0, but I am going to, let's say, start at... Um, pH 2, and write pH 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, and 12. All right, and now this is actually very different to temperature. We are also going to get um, denaturation, so the, the enzymes can be denatured at certain pHs, but it depends on which enzyme we're talking about. And I'm going to give you two examples. Now, the first one is going to be pepsin. Pepsin is found in the stomach, okay? And you should know that stomach produces acid. So you've heard stomach acid before. The st inside of the stomach is acidic, okay? And so the enzyme needs to work well at acidic pHs. Turns out it does. And the optimum pH for uh, pepsin is around about pH 3, okay? And that is acidic because 7 is neutral. So I'm going to draw it in red. And we're going to say that the optimum is around about here, okay? And either side of your optimum pH, you're going to get uh, the enzyme denaturing. And so the enzyme denatures, um, or its, its activity is less on the left-hand side and also on the right-hand side, and it will eventually denature uh, around about 5 or 6. Okay? The reason being is that the optimum pH is 3, and if you go too far outside of the optimum pH either side, then it denatures, okay? I'll explain why in a second, but I'll just draw another graph. So the other example you're given in your book is pancreatic amylase, okay? Amylase is responsible um, for breaking down sugars, uh, large sugars, that is, carbohydrates, I should say, it's into sugars. Now, that works at around about pH 7 to pH 8, and so the optimum is going to be around here, okay? And so we're going to have a graph that looks something like that, okay? So I'm gonna say that this is amylase, okay? And this one is pepsin from the stomach. All right, so you can see that they don't work at the same pHs because pepsin is in your stomach and amylase is not, it's in the pancreas. Right, now why is this? why, why does this happen? Now, proteins are held together by different bonds, okay? Um, some of those bonds include hydrogen bonds, and they include ionic bonds. Now, different pHs causes those bonds to be affected. They can either be uh, flipped and swapped with each other, or they can either be deleted or 
um, they could it could cause the bonds to be between different parts of the protein. Now, if you have bonds disrupted, what happens is the shape of the enzyme is also disrupted because now the bonds are in different places. Okay, so if the shape of the enzyme is disrupted, let's say you had an enzyme that looked like our last one did, okay, and that was at pH uh, three. So let's say that was pepsin. Okay, at pH eight, okay. Pepsin, the bonds have been disrupted so much that we might have a shape that looks like this, right? This is just a uh, an example. But you can see that what has changed dramatically are the active sites. Active site, and this is the active site. Now, if this is the active site, okay, up here, that means a substrate of this sort of shape is going to fit in. Now if you take that substrate, so you take that substrate and you try and put it in the new enzyme, look it just completely doesn't fit, right? It doesn't fit so the reaction is not going to be catalyzed and that is why you get um, the rate of reaction plummeting, okay? And so the enzyme we say has been denatured, okay? When that rate of reaction goes down, um, as a result of this shape being permanently changed, the enzyme has been denatured, okay? So a denatured enzyme or a denatured protein, okay, is one in which the shape has been irreversibly changed, okay? And that affects its function, and so it's not going to work anymore. Okay, and that is about enough, I think, on there. So I hope that has helped. Um, if you do have any questions on anything I covered in this video, then please do feel free um, to either write me a direct email using... Uh, the link in the description box below or write a comment in the comment box and I'll be sure to get back to you. Um, but I look forward to seeing you in the next one.